Old Enough to Die Vanity Fair, June 1999 The United States of America executes its own children. What is wrong with that sentence? Well, nothing factual. We may differ about whether the formative years are an age of innocence or experience, but a whole body of law establishes and defends certain age limits below which one is considered a child. And 73 such children have been growing old under sentence of death in American prisons, as I write. William Blake, who perhaps excelled all other authors in his rage against cruelty to the young, put his little boy lost in the experience section of his songs of innocence and of experience. The weeping child could not be heard. The weeping parents wept in vain. They stripped him to his little shirt and bound him in an iron chain and burned him in a holy place where many had been burned before. The weeping parents wept in vain. Are such things done on Albion Shore? Albion Shore, an antique name for England, was in the 18th and 19th centuries, famous for two things, intense sentimentality about images of innocent children and extreme ruthlessness in the sexual and commercial and penal treatment of the very young. We shake our heads now at the obviousness of this hypocrisy, but here's what happened to George Stinney in Clarendon County, South Carolina, on June the 16th, 1944. At the age of 14, weighing 95 pounds and standing 5 feet and 1 inch, he was lashed into an electric chair and a mask was put over his face. He was then given a hit of 2,400 volts. The mask, which was perhaps too big for him, thereupon slipped off. The witnesses saw his wide open and weeping eyes and his dribbling mouth before another two jolts ended the business and fried him for good. They may not have burned him in a holy place, but it was a reverent state occasion, and you can bet there was a minister on hand to see fair play done. But you say, this kind of thing doesn't go on anymore. That's true, up to a point. On Albion shore, it certainly doesn't, nor are juveniles sentenced to death in any other European nation. Since 1990, indeed, only six countries have executed juvenile offenders. Iran, Yemen, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, and the United States of America. The United States, as you may be interested to hear, left the silver and bronze medals to be divided among those other fine contenders, keeping the gold for itself, both by conducting the most executions and by having the largest number of juveniles awaiting extinction on death row. Now exactly what kind of village does this take? I can scarcely scan the press without learning that our kids are in need of more protection. In their name, I'm supposed to have my internet access and my cable TV more closely supervised. It will be years until I can send my teenage son out to buy my whiskey and my tobacco supplies, and years until he can buy his own. You can't vote or be empaneled on a jury or sign up to be all you can be in Kosovo until you're at least 18. But if you step far enough out of line, the protections that safeguard the minor are abruptly withdrawn and the state will snuff you out like an old sow that eats her farrow. On the whole, and in most states of the Union that rely on the death penalty, you need to be at least 16 to hear a judge instruct the proper authorities to take your life. But Governor Gary Johnson of New Mexico and former Governor Pete Wilson of California are impatient with this kid-glove leniency. They have toyed with the idea that eighth graders be brought within the tough love embrace of the gas chamber and the lethal injection. Johnson, by calling for the execution of 13-year-olds, and Wilson, influenced no doubt by California's laid-back style, by suggesting that the authorities wait only, let's try not to be sentimental, or rather, let us see what happens if we are not. Teenagers can be hell, and they have attained the age of reason, if not responsibility. Most adults, reviewing the molten years of their own puberty, can think of at least one occasion where they really, really needed a break or a second chance, and where their lives and careers might have been literally as well as figuratively over if they hadn't had one. Get me out of this, and I swear. But then most people manage to get by without turning a 44 on their folks, and without, as young Master George Stinney was said to have done, murdering an 11-year-old girl.
Sean Sellers, the condemned American youth most recently executed for crimes committed when he was 16, was a bad poster boy for any cause. The state of Oklahoma killed him last February the 4th for the casual murder of a store clerk and the deliberate slaying of his mother and stepfather. He never seriously pretended to be innocent. Indeed, he was engaged at the time in a supposedly satanic effort to violate all of the Ten Commandments. While on death row, he additionally failed to get my personal vote by professing ostentatious reborn Christian evangelism and by featuring on a website devoted to redemption through fundamentalist writings and a comic book. However, you do not lose any, let alone all, of your civil rights by opting for either yucky cults or sickly religiosity. Where would we be if you did? And the question for me became as I went into the case, was this boy gravely sick or not? There is, after all, a legal and moral presumption against executing even adults who are insane. Anyone who's been involved with a death row prisoner knows the piercing yet dull sense of pity and shame that descends. It's always the same. The family background that makes you want to weep. The home usually festooned, as in the seller's case, with deadly weapons. The educational and cultural level that would raise eyebrows in Calcutta or Bogota. The overworked public defender who had two dimes and two days to make his case. The absence of any useful teacher or priest or shrink or counsellor until it was too damned late. The occasional thoughtful relative who puts up some dough, the endless hearings and rehearings, and then the long dreary wait for a stay of execution that becomes a torture if it comes at all. Sometimes at the last minute, an intercession from a celebrity or a certified moral authority, and then the tawdry ritual with the needles or the gas or the electric current, and then on to the next. Often abandoned as an infant by his truck driving mother and stepfather, his maternal grandfather took his side at trial, and introduced to Satanism by one of his many babysitters, Sean Sellers seems to have suffered from a childhood brain lesion and from multiple personality disorder. Bob Ravitz, the public defender who represented him, was allowed by the state $750 to pay for an expert witness, but on this princely scale wasn't able to afford a proper psychiatric evaluation. The extent of the boy's disorder, several different styles of handwriting, several different names for himself, various delusions, even the ability to switch from left to right-handedness, was not discovered until he'd been on death row for an awfully long time. But the whole point of the appeals procedure and the whole justification for the grisly business of warehousing condemned people is to avoid a miscarriage of justice. In 1992, six years after his trial, a panel of three physicians administered a quantitative electroencephalograph test to the boy, who had become a legal adult while in prison. They discovered the traces of the childhood brain injury, the presence of several alter personalities, and the strong likelihood, therefore, that Sean Sellers had not in any sense attained a condition of criminal responsibility when he was tried and convicted. Here comes the part that causes me to make a low and growling noise, even as I reread it for the dozenth time. In February 1998, the United States Court of Appeals, Tenth Circuit, finally heard the medical and psychiatric evidence that had gone undiscovered at the initial arraignment. The three judges wrote the following opinion. Although troubled by the extent of uncontroverted clinical evidence proving petitioners suffer from multiple personality disorder now and at the time of the offences of conviction, and that the offences were committed by an alter personality, we are constrained to hold petitioner has failed to establish grounds for federal habeas corpus relief. Even though his illness is such that he may be able to prove his factual innocence of those crimes, we believe that he must be left to the avenue of executive clemency to pursue that claim. So, a sober panel of robed figures calmly reviewing the life and death case of a disturbed child determines in writing that said child may be factually or technically innocent, but further determines that this is not really any of its business. A federal district court in Oklahoma had briefly considered Sean Sellers' case in light of Clinton's newly minted Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, AEDPA. This brave new law says that if you don't present your exculpatory evidence by a given date, then you are too late, mate. However, 
it wasn't this provision that doomed the appeal or its successor pleas in higher courts. The controlling legal authority here is the decision of the Rehnquist Supreme Court in 1993 known as Herrera v. Collins, where it was boldly stated that the execution of an innocent person is not necessarily a violation of federal constitutional protections. This February, Sellers was led out of his cell and put down like a diseased animal. Article 6, Number 5 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights states that the sentence of death shall not be imposed for crimes committed by persons below 18 years of age. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child makes the same stipulation. So does the American Convention on Human Rights. The United States has signed the first and third of these treaties while reserving the right to execute any person except a pregnant woman, presumably out of deference to the natural right of children rather than mothers. It is one of only two nations that have yet to ratify the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The other non-signatory is Somalia, for reasons you probably don't want to think about. Even Iran and Saudi Arabia have ratified the UN Convention. So astoundingly at variance with the international community is the position of the American state that in 1997, the UN Commission on Human Rights asked its special rapporteur to visit this country to seek meetings with high officials and to report back. At once, there was a titanic outcry from Senator Jesse Helms and others. What is this? We monitor other people's violations. How dare you ask to inspect ours? Adults sentenced to death in this country are almost always vicious creeps, pitiable failures or innocent losers. Recall the instance of Anthony Porter, freed from 17 years on death row this February after a Northwestern University journalism class did a project on his case by pure chance and discovered what the prosecutors and the judges had not, that he could not possibly have committed the double murder. For one thing, the more plausible suspect confessed to the crime the sort of fact a good prosecutor is trained never to overlook. Mr. Porter has an IQ of 51, and is, in his way, a child also. But the children condemned to death are losers in a category all their own. A decade ago, the American Journal of Psychiatry published an investigation using a sample of four states that covered juveniles on hold for execution. There were 14 of them. Only two of these had IQ scores higher than 90. Every one of them had suffered severe head trauma during childhood. All had deep psychiatric problems. Only two had managed to grow up without extreme physical or sexual abuse, and five of them had undergone this at the hands of family members. Only five of them had been evaluated by psychiatrists before standing trial. In case you wonder, yes, a disproportionate number of them were African-American. I don't think that Master George Stinney, see above, would have been roasted by the state of South Carolina even in 1944 if the same hadn't been as true of him as it was untrue of his victim. Very often, in fact, these miners are in trouble, real bad trouble, because they were the ones too slow or too panicked to flee the scene, or because they were used by cynical older criminals as patsies or decoys. Joseph John Cannon, executed in Texas in April of last year, was illiterate, brain-damaged, sexually scarred, and heavily addicted when they caught him at the age of 17. He had attempted suicide at age 15 and told his interviewers that he could not remember anything good that had ever happened to him. Well, it was apparently the job of the state of Texas to make sure that this unbroken record was maintained. During his execution by lethal injection, which took place over the objections of His Holiness the Pope, who was overruled by Governor George W. Bush, the needle blew out of Cannon's arm and the witnesses had to wait while a drape was brought in and a new vein was found. And the irony was not at Joseph John Cannon's expense. It may seem odd to some people reading this column that the United States joins Yemen and Pakistan in putting down its troublesome young and that it reads lectures on human rights to other countries while refusing to ratify treaties which most civilized societies regard as the ABCs of law. But I doubt Joseph John Cannon would have seen the joke. He probably never realized that he was living in the land of the free and the home of the brave to begin with. And soon, he wasn't. 
and a country with a positive glut of lawyers and grief counsellors and spiritual awareness artists and fancy shrinks will continue to wonder what is wrong with kids these days. End of Disc 4